I don't want to be on that much. Okay. They were ready. I'm just hanging out chilling. Are we on? Yay. All right. Well, again, thank you all for coming and being a part of this time together tonight so we can celebrate uh, with Bella her salvation at church camp, at Crossland's camp. And, and then to just be a part of our, the service time that we have together. And it's an honor. Uh, I consider it an honor and privilege to be able to come into these waters, whether they're cold or not, to uh, celebrate uh, anyone who's, who's being baptized, to be able to baptize. Uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's been kind of neat because being on Facebook at times, um, uh, Laura Bitten, I think my post, my, a memory came up today on mine where I baptized Saul seven years ago today. I think that's right. So we've been baptizing for seven years out here. So, I mean, for me, it's absolutely great to be able to do that. And I'm glad you're here tonight for that same thing. Bella, come on. Honey, it's cold, but you'll be all right. Just pretend you're at the lake at camp. The lips are turning blue. There you go. Just... I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. I take God as my Father. I take God as my Father. Jesus as my Savior. Jesus as my Savior. The Holy Spirit as my Guide. The Holy Spirit as my Guide. This I do freely. This I do freely. Completely. Completely. And forever. And forever. Amen. Amen. All right. Behold. Behold is now holy. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Christ. and upon your profession of faith in Him. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good? do the polar plunge before uh, before we get started no volunteers okay number 546 is love lifted me we're going to uh we'll sing all three verses of that and again let's stand as we sing love lifted me it's number 546 i was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deep Stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now save them high. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love. Will obey, be your 
Savior wants to be, be saved today. Uplifted me, uplifted me. When nothing else could help, uplifted me, uplifted me, uplifted me. Turn over to number 203. His name is wonderful. Number 203 in your hymnals. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Brother Mike, you okay now? I'm good. You all right? You warmed up? No. <laughs> okay. No. Tom, I'll use this the pulpit microphone. I wanted to share with you this evening a little devotional time before we uh, go enjoy some cake, right? Did I, I didn't speak too soon on that one there. Just some cake, and, and I brought ice cream. So, because uh, what's cake without a little bit of ice cream? I don't have a scoop, but uh, <laughs> we all gather around it with a spoon, I guess, and just dig in. I, I want to share something with you for just a few moments out of Acts in the eighth chapter. A pastor asked some children in the church a couple of questions. He said, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage, gave all my money to the church, would I get to heaven? The children said, no, no. He said, if I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard, kept everything neat and tidy, would I get into heaven? And again, the answer was no. So he said, and the last thing, he said, then, then how can I get into heaven? One of the kids jumped up and said, you got to be dead first. <laughs> what does it mean to be the church and to really serve the Lord? Can we, can, can we call can, can, can we hear the call to reach out and, 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 and share uh, our faith with, with, with moms and dads or brothers and sisters, friends, co-workers, classmates? Do we hear that call to do that very, that very thing? The church is called to be scattered. The church is called to scatter. Not just to be scattered, but to scatter. And now the word scatter means to throw loosely about. And we don't want the church to be called 
you know, just a group of people who are loosely about or bound or whatever it may be, just, just to be out there. You know, in, in reality, we have a calling upon our lives. And, and, and we are called to be focused on the very thing that God wants us to do. And if we are not focused on that, then we are just scattered. So there is a calling upon us to, to get out and, and to tell others and, and uh, you all uh, huddle up around her because she's cold. <laughs> In, instead of huddling together, our calling is to scatter and to share. God has one desire for the church. God has one desire for each of us and that is to go and share the good news. To make known his truth, his word, his plan. And so what does it mean for us to be a scattered church? Let me go to the scripture in Acts 8, 1 through 8. It says, on that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women and put them in prison. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said as they listened and saw the signs he was performing. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, so there was great joy in the city. When I think about the church being scattered, the first thing that I think about for us is that, based on the scripture, that, is that we leave our comfort zone. In a couple of weeks, there's going to be some of folks who are out of this church that are heading down to Cuba for the first time and going into a country that has always been notoriously known for its communism and, and the difficulties. I mean, I've been there a couple of times and I, I haven't found it to be very difficult at all. This time it may be completely different. I don't know. But you know what? It, it, we're called to leave our comfort zone. That doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has to go. For some of you, you're going to Charleston, right? And that's out of your comfort zone because it's a new location, a new event, new, new everything. Philip had become very successful in serving the Lord. It was pretty good. Uh, in Acts chapter 6, he had been called uh, to wait on tables, And because of his faithfulness and and that of the apostles and others called to this ministry, it says in Acts 6-7 that the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now that would have been enough for me. I mean, that sounds exciting. People are getting saved. The number of people in the church is increasing. Priests from the Jewish faith are becoming Christian becoming obedient to the faith, but God wanted more. And this is how I see the church of who we are, because in the, in the next, in chapter 8, verse 26, we read the text that says, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, who's the one who was serving tables there, and who one had things going on, it was a good ministry, things were happening there. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, about everyone here, just about everyone in here has probably heard, seen or heard of the movie Titanic. It's on the news right now because of, of something that's going on that's kind of tragic that's happening there right now. More than 1,500 people out of the 2,200 that were on that vessel died when it sank on April 15th, 1912. And perhaps the greatest tragedy of that was that many of those people did not have to die. See, a lot of people climbed into the 20 lifeboats that, lifeboats that were available there, but, uh, but many of the boats were only half full. Hundreds of people were in the cold water with life preservers on. Now, we learned from this that um, um, they, didn't, they didn't die from drowning. They froze to death in the water. Because none of the boats that had gone, the lifeboats that were getting toward shore, none of them came back to to get the other people out of the water for fear that they would be capsizing themselves. 
It didn't have to happen that way. As a matter of fact, only one lifeboat did return, but it was too late. Of the hundreds of people that were in the water, only six people survived. Only six people were pulled from the water. Those who were already saved didn't go after those who were dying. You see where I'm going. When we pray and we're asking God to extend our territory, we're asking God to save souls and use us and, and all these things, all that's there, you got to ask God to break our hearts in such a way so that those of us who are already saved will go after those who are dying. See, the truth of it is, Bella, you got your heavenly ticket punched. The scripture tells us, I believe wholeheartedly, the scripture teaches us that once we give our lives to Christ, man, we're his. We are saved to the uttermost because it is a gift from God, not of man that anyone should boast. You know, it's his doing for us. But if that's where you stop, if that's where any of us stop, then we've made the mistake of thinking, about, okay, I'm in the lifeboat, then I don't have to go after anybody else that's dying. And that's not true at all. The, uh, it, it tells us here in chapter 8, verses 27 through 30, so he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian man, a, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. So when Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? So let me tell you, the scattered church means, it not only means that we leave our comfort zone, but it also means that we are led by the spirit. We let God lead us how he wants to. You see, it begins with being filled with the Spirit of God. Now, in a Baptist faith, we believe that once I give my life to Christ, that very instant, I am filled with the Holy Spirit. God comes in and fills me, and he never, ever leaves me. I take him places where he doesn't want to go, but he goes with me to protect me and, and keep watch over me, to convict me of my sin and to guide me into the path of righteousness. I believe wholeheartedly that God is watching and going and doing everything that I do, whether good or bad. And once you're filled with the Spirit of God, are you done? Well, of course not. Philip obeyed. He was led by the Spirit. He heard the Spirit of God speak into his heart and say, go join yourself with that chariot. And he went. So we are led by the Spirit. Another thing that takes place with the scattered church is that we tell the story. There was a question to ask there in verse 30. As we read already, Philip ran up to it, to the chariot. He heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Hear me on this. We must not be afraid to approach people when the Holy Spirit leads us to them. Because if the Holy Spirit is leading us to them, the Holy Spirit is going to give us what we need. If I was concerned about what I was going to say, or, or how I was going to respond, you know, what, was, what I was going to say, and what I was going to ask, whatever, I would never be able to talk to anyone because I've shared this openly before that I'm this introvert person who would rather sit by myself alone for away from everybody and not talk to anybody at any given time of the day. I'm the guy that intentionally avoids people at times, but not because I want to avoid people, but because I don't know what to say. But when it comes to speaking up for the Lord, I don't worry about those things because I figure if the Holy Spirit is in me and lead me, then he's going to be true to his word and tell me, this is what you're going to say, or this is, it just comes out. It just comes out. So he's going to lead us there. And then there's going to be the scripture to read. In Acts 8, verses 32 and 33, it says, Now the scripture passage that this Ethiopian was reading was, He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. 
Who will describe his generation for his life is taken from the earth? I think about what scripture I use. Now I know this is my life. This is what I do. But what I have found to be true is that if, if there are verses of scripture that, that, that stand out in your mind, things that are there that need to be there, in, you should make a practice of reading scripture, okay? It just should be a part of your life. Just doesn't have to be this drudgery and, and I've got to memorize all the scripture, but I'm just saying if you expose yourself to the word of God, the word of God will expose itself in you and through you to those who need him. I mean, that's just what will happen. It, it will just happen that way. What scripture do you use? What's your go-to? You know, if somebody says, man, I, I, don't, I don't know about this God thing. I don't know about Jesus and, the, you know, I saw a Facebook thing that I was a part of, that a group that I'm a part of with wood turning and woodworkers, and they had they had showed a church pew, and said, "What would I do with this?" And there were all these comments that came on there about the the negative aspect of what you could do with a church pew, or how difficult it was to sit in those things and all that kind of stuff that went along with that. Now, it wasn't padded, it wasn't a padded pew like we enjoy. But at the same time, the thoughts that ran through my head to which I responded to add in there, and I'm sure I'll, I'll get negative comments, but I don't care. I can tell you what to do with a church pew. When I think of a church pew, I think of, uh, there's a flood of memories that come through my brain. I think of church pews that were uncomfortable to sit in, like union number two, church. Those pews were so uncomfortable. Sherilyn's dad's church. But we went, we sat there. And I think of some that were very comfortable to be a part of. And, and personally, I haven't sat in the church pew very much in my entire life. And I don't know how anybody does it to begin with, comfortable or not. But I don't think we should be afraid of what to say or what scripture to use to be the church that scatters. We should allow the Holy Spirit to choose the scripture. It's always going to be the right one. Let me give you just one other thing there's a truth to be explained because the eunuch said in verse 34 and 35 he said to Philip I ask you who is the prophet saying, saying this about himself or someone else and Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus beginning with that scripture I had a gentleman ask me one time in Brazil I couldn't I didn't understand what he was saying but I threw an interpreter and he asked he, he gave me an analogy he wasn't a believer at that time but he gave me an analogy of a, of a Brazilian Indian tribe who had slaughtered missionaries that had come across because they were promoting a god that the chief of the tribe did not recognize. And so they, and he asked me, how do you explain the gospel to something like that? And I began in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God. And we established a belief in God to begin with. And then just went from there. And I have no idea how far or how long we went or what all we talked about. But we end it with Jesus. And that man and his wife were gloriously saved right there. It's because you just let them, let, you just explain the truth. How is anyone going to know the truth about Jesus if you don't tell them? That's, that's who you're called to be. That's what you're called to be. God has a plan for your life. Now, to finish out right there, it says, and they were traveling down the road. They came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Azotus. And as he was, and he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. 
God used him in this situation to change the life of one individual. He was enjoying ministry in the church with lots of people. And God said, go take care of this one. You need to talk to him. I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to give you everything that you need. I'm going to take you and scatter you from this part to over to this part. God's moving you from this part to this part. But it doesn't stop the calling that's on your life. It doesn't change. I look across here, and I, there are there are, are, are several who have come here from other places. Some not too far away. Some from too far away. I don't know why you ever, why you ever want to live in Michigan to begin with. Just, there you go. There you go. <laughs> and, and Doug, you've been everywhere. I think you've been all over the place. So. Yeah, I mean, and so the point of it is right there is that wherever you've come from, whether it's just across town or whether it's across the country and wherever you're going, whether it's back across town or to another part of the country, let the Spirit move you and use you and grow you to speak through you. Wherever he sends you. Wherever he sends you. And because that's how the kingdom of God grows. And that's what we're all about. Our purpose is not to come and just sit. Our purpose is to move out of pews and into the hearts of those who need Jesus. Stand with me. Let's pray. Bella, we celebrate with you tonight all that God is doing in you. And, and it's just, just the tip of the iceberg for you. Just the tip of it. Get into church. Come on, go, go get into church down there. And we'll celebrate that too. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being online with us tonight. I'm sure there are some that are. And uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for giving us this time together to allow us to celebrate with Bella and her family and her friends everything that you're doing in her life and in their lives as well. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we pray for the opportunity for them to have a, a new church family, a new church home. And we pray, Lord, for all those that you bring into this body to grow and become a part of this church family. And may we be constantly aware, Lord, Make us aware of the needs of those around us in such a way that our voices speak your truth in some way, that our lives reflect the reality of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for that. Thank you for all you've done and how you've blessed this congregation in such, such a way and how you continue to move and guide us and even though we say, are saying goodbye to some, we are grateful, Lord, that you have allowed us to say hello to so many as well. And the journey continues. Lead us on that journey in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Now, we're, we're going next door, right? Help me out. Make sure we're going next door. Yeah, Tony says, yes, we're going next door. Yeah. Do you need to be baptized? I can put you on. All right. You're dismissed. Let's go next door. Everybody's invited to come next.